1 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2 says, I urge you then, first of all, the petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Say, all people. This is Paul writing to Timothy in one of his letters. He's urging Timothy. As a matter of fact, this is one of the books that our uh, junior hires in high school uh, young men are um, studying. And we learned that Timothy was a, uh, he, he was a pastor. He was someone that had a huge congregation. Some scholars believe that he had a congregation of about 10,000 people. So Paul, of course, was given a lot of instruction to Timothy. And one of the instructions that we read here is it says, I urge, I urge you, I tell you, I, I first of all, Timothy, you have a lot of people you have to take care of as a pastor. But I urge you, Timothy, to pray, to, to make peti uh, petitions for prayer, intercession. And not only that, but also thanksgiving for all people. Say all people. For kings and for those in authority that we may live, live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Church, we are asked to come together as a body of Christ and to pray for our leaders, to pray for our country, to pray for our president, so that we may leave, live a peaceful, quiet life in all godliness and holiness. Wouldn't you want to live that kind of life here on earth right now? Like, not, let's not just wait till we get to heaven. Can we just right here, right now, live a peaceful, godly, and holy life? I say amen. I say amen to that. That we will stop the wars. That we will stop the going back and forth. That we will stop the hatred. But instead that we can live together. Would you join me as we pray for our president, as we pray for our country? If you don't mind just holding the pen next to the person next to you. Father, we come before you as a church. You put this in the heart of one of your servants, Franklin Graham, God, for him to ask and urge all the churches to continue with the petition, to con continue asking for peace, to continue asking, Father, for guidance for our president. Father God, you have placed him in office for a reason. You have placed his cabinet in office for a reason. You have placed everyone in this country in their spot for a reason. You are still in control. You are the God that protects us. You are the God that guides us. You are the God that takes care of it all. So God, we pray that your hand will be up upon our president. We pray that your hand will be upon this country. That we will continue having, Lord, the opportunities to be a blessing to one another and to be a blessing into this world. God, we are asking you for peace. We are asking you for peace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, church, in the same way as you uh, come today and, and every first Sunday of the month, we love to remember what Jesus did on that cross. Right there where you are, if you have some sort of a, a, a quarrel or, or, or still angry about something, just say, God, just forgive me. Forgive my thoughts and my intentions. Forgive uh, just any thought, Lord, that has been in my heart because I want to be able to remember what you did on the cross in a worthy manner. God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Now, church, just like before, these two sections will face each other. We'll come and get these tables and then exit out that way this side please face each other through that aisle come this way and then exit out as well in jesus name let's do this together amen come on go ahead you can come on it was my cross you bore so i could live in the freedom you died
the book of John, chapter 3, the New Living Translation, the Lord talks to us in this way. There was an, a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that, you, uh, that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. The wind, the wind blows uh, wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish leader or teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, I, I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God uh, loved the world. He gave his only, his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Wow. We give thanks to the Lord in this beautiful day when we are taking this Holy Communion in remembrance of what the Lord did in the cross of Calvary for each one of us. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks to the Lord for it. Then he broke it in, in, in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread. the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood 
do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Father, thank you for the bread that we have just eaten that represents your holy body, that body that suffers so much for each one of us. Your body became a father sore, and by your wounds, O oh Father, we have been healed. And Father, you took our place to pay for us. And thank you, Father, for doing that. When your body was nailed to the cross, you were nailing all our sins against that cross. Thank you, Father, for doing that. And Father, now I have the cup that represents your holy blood. The blood that was shared for each one of us. That blood that cleanses us from all our sins. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for sharing your, shedding your blood, oh, Father, for each one of us. And thank you, Father, for cleansing us from our sins. And thank you, Father, because through that blood, you signed the new covenant. And in the new covenant, we are not under the law anymore. But Father, now we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your blessings. Let's drink the cup. Take your seat, go ahead and say hello to the person next to you and tell them I'm so glad that you made it here this morning. <clears throat> what a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, amen. Best. If you uh, graduated last week or this week, congratulations to all of our graduates. We uh, honored you last week, so um, uh, we continue to honor you uh, because we know that this is not the end. This is actually the very beginning, right? This is the very beginning. And um, we are starting a new series today, and we call it Move. Tap your neighbor and tell him, Move. Um, and if they actually move, praise God. And if the word is working. Uh, the reason why we, I want to do a series on move, um, this has kind of just been in, uh, again, I, uh, I am moved <laughs> by words. I'm moved by songs. And so when I present a, an idea to the pastoral team, I, you know, there's just, it's just really cool to see how, um, you can just go through the Bible, and every story, if not all of the stories, when God said something, it always requires 
for the people, for the individual, for the, the whole nation to actually physically move, to move. And so through this series, we're going to share with you some stories where God said so, said a word, said a command, said something, and then people just had the chance to actually move forward. Now, on the, on the slide, you see sort of like the ocean. Because when I think of movement, I think of water. Water is constantly moving. You ever notice that? As a matter of fact, if you go to uh, Galveston Beach and you actually go into the water, and when you come out and you go back inside, you are not going back to the same amount or, or the same uh, spot of water that you went in earlier. Water just moves and it moves and it moves. Now, there is some water that doesn't move. Uh, what is that word? Stagnant water? Charco, right? But if you ever had a charco, if you ever had a stagnant water outside your house, there's only two things that that water is good for. Now, one is to create and make more mosquitoes for us. And another one, it just stinks. It just leaves a, a very ugly uh, smell. So how many of you want to be a charco? And how many of you, you want to be a river or an ocean? Amen. Just be a part of that. So we're moving. Here's our ski. Uh, our ski. <laughs> Here's our ski scripture. That's a new word for Pastor Jonathan. Make sure you use it. This is our ski scripture of the, of the month. Psalms th uh, 37, 23. Read it with me. It's right underneath it if you can see it. If not, go ahead and go to the other one, Sam. Let's read it together. This is our scripture for this, uh, um, this, uh, Sam, I moved on to you. I'm sorry. Go ahead uh, to verse 23. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. And that's a promise for you and for me. That if you decide to move, then the Lord makes firm your steps of those who delight in him. Now, another reason why I love the word move is because we are starting uh, to prep ourselves. We already, you know, a while back started, but more so now because we're in the month of June. Our conference, our youth conference is in uh, the end of June, and we actually title it Move. And in this word, is just a play on words. If you look at the word move by itself, uh, if you look at the word move, we just kind of saw that there's also another word or another phrase. If you go to it, it's I love so if you say, I love the Lord, then move. As simple as that. If you truly love the Lord, then you will move. All right. So if you have your Bibles, I want to uh, finish that uh, Psalms 37. Uh, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Verse 24 says, though he may stumble, because we will stumble as we move in our walk with the Lord. He will not fall. We might stumble, but we will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Just kind of think about uh, my oldest son is here. And, and as whenever you are a first-time parent, any first-time parents here? Any first-time parents here? If you're a first-time parent, uh, let's switch mics. <clears throat> if you're a first-time parent, I'm going to give you the secret to being a successful parent. Are you ready? Here we go. If you're a first-time parent, then... And that's the secret of being a first-time parent. All right? If you're a first-time parent, you are so cautious of everything, right? First-time parents, you bought all the things the book said, right? You bought the, the most expensive diapers. You bought the most expensive wipes. Why? Because they're going to do their job and they're going to do it well, right? <laughs> I mean, you bought the most expensive car seat. You bought the most. I mean, no one drove your baby around. You were the one who took care of them. And as they began to walk, you were the one who held their hand. I still remember Josiah's first steps. Uh, my goodness. I still remember the first time that he tasted chocolate for the very, very first time. His legs kept just going like this. He couldn't stand all the sugar that he just consumed. But as you uh, become a second-time parent, any second-time parents, right? Any third-time parents? 
any four-time parents, right? I mean, by that time, it was like, just put a piece of paper around him. He'll be all right, right? But the Lord, the Lord, my point was, he will be with you and now allow you to fall because he upholds you with his hand. Even though he has plenty of children throughout the world, you are still considering, consider his most precious possession. And how does that, how does God do that? I don't know. But he is able to have a personal relationship with each and every one of you. Somebody say, praise God. Praise the Lord. Uh, 25 says, I was young and I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken of their children begging for bread. Verse 26, they are, they are always generous and lend friendly. Their children will be a blessing. Verse 27, here's a command. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land, how, uh, how long, church? The land forever. Last verse. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Wrongdoers will completely be destroyed. The offspring will, the, the wicked will perish. One last one, sorry. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it when, church? Forever. So in other words, this uh, six verses or five, six verses, it just puts the word move into perspective, that there is a blessing. There is, church, a benefit for us to move. Look at your neighbor and tell him move. Tap your neighbor on the other side and tell him move. You got to move. You got to move. If you kind of look at it as well, think about it as you're growing up as a child, you want them to move. You want them to move through school. You want them to move through kindergarten. Many of you, my son graduated from kindergarten, and you all seen that joke that the kids say, that's it, I graduated. I never have to go to school again. No, that's just the beginning of it all again. We all want them to move through first grade, elementary, junior high, high school. We want our kids to move, right, church? Amen, parents, right? We want our kids to move. We want them to move into successful careers. We want them to move and become uh, amazing parents. How many of you parents, you want your, ki your, your, your kids to be better than you are? I want my kids to have better things than I am, than I have. I want them to have a better education than I did. I want them to have a better house, a better job. I want them to be a provide for their families better than I have. That's our goal as parents in that church. We want them to move. We want them to move through the system. It's the same way when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. We got to move through our relationship with Christ. We got to move. We can't just accept him and then just wait till he comes back from heaven. No, we got to keep moving. We got to keep moving forward because God has many things to show you and me right here on this earth, right here on this earth. But we must move. Tap your neighbor one more time and tell him you got to move. You got to move. You got to move. So I have a story, if you have your Bibles, in 2 Kings chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. And all of us probably are uh, aware of this story, the story of Naaman. And so uh, I was, was what I want to do is I just want to read through the story. And as I read through the story, I want to stop at a couple of points. And then I want us to apply what the Bible is teaching us to us here today. Because we have to. To move. We have to move. If not, we are just going to become stagnant people. So here's one of the stories that I'm mentioning to you that has to do with this word move. There's a command and then there's always an option for you. That's what I love about our God. What I love about our God is that he gives us the option to move or to stay right where we are. He is not a God that pushes us and forces us to do something that we are not comfortable with. He is a God of patience. He's a God that will wait on you to see when you will take that first step. Young people, young person, young man, young lady, I'm encouraging you to take hold of these words. Because at your age right now, if you hold these truths in your heart and you put them to practice, believe me, as you get older, life will be a lot easier, a lot better. It might be getting a little harder, it depends, but at least you will have the word of God with you to keep moving forward. 
So this is a story of Naaman. I love the introduction. Look at verse 1 in chapter 5 of 2 Kings. Check this out. It says, the king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman. Say the word Naaman. The commander of his army. Because through him the Lord had given Aram or Aram great victories. Now was this a great man, Naaman? He was. Was he a great soldier? He sure was. Was he a victorious man? He sure was. He had given uh, Aram great victories. Just imagine. Just imagine a stud. You know what I mean? Just imagine this amazing, amazing superhero even you can say. Just imagine this man who stood tall. He had his armor. He had his sword. He had his, his nice and sandals. I don't know. I mean, he just had it everything. He had every weapon that's imaginable. And he was a victorious man. And his king, his leader, was very pleased with him. But then look at the end of verse 1. Right off the bat. Right at the beginning of this story. But though Naaman was a mighty what church? Well, Naaman was a mighty warrior. He suffered from leprosy. Now, again, I love to just read through the word and just apply it to our lives. Because every single one of us here on this earth, we all have amazing qualities to our lives. We, all of us, every single one of you, you are designed to do something. And some of you, a lot of you, you are really good at what God has called you to do. You're really good at your career. You're really good at, at the education field that you are in. You're really good with your hands. You're really good with your mind. Some of you ladies, you're really good at organizing some stuff. Some of you guys, you are really good about something. You're really good about something. I was waiting for the wife to say something like, they're really good at the grass. Oh, my God, I love him, you know. I mean, you're really good at it. Every single one of us, we all have something to give back. And if you're sitting there and saying, no, I, 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 I don't. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You were created with a purpose. God has placed a desire. God has designed you in one way or another so that you can give him glory with what you have. And it might be that you are just really good in your house to do something that you can be a blessing to someone else. There's some people here that we don't even know, but there's some people here. There might be some people here that we don't know that you've been cooking meals for some neighbors, and we never know. You're, you're, you're not that kind of person that you post on Instagram or Facebook. Look, I'm feeding the hungry, you know? No. You just simply do it. It's in your heart. You know what I mean? Some of you, you're so good with, with a trait that you just go and bless someone else. Right now, we are in the hot season, and some of you have opened up your homes for someone who does not have a cooling AC system. And we'll never know. You're just so good at what God has given you. But let's be honest. Every single one of us, if we were to tell your story, every single one of us will end our success, our achievements, but at the bottom, you know those little, those little words that we can't read on the commercials that go really fast, right? It says, but we all suffer from something. And in this case, it's leprosy. Now, please remember that leprosy was the, uh, the sickness that no one could heal. Leprosy was the sickness that your um, uh, antidote or your, uh, the recommendation from the doctor, from the doctor of the town, was for you to live this, leave the city. Just, just be exiled. Just move on. You got to go on and live on your, by yourselves or with a community of other lepers. That was the remedy. That was the solution. There was no cure. Now, sure, leprosy could take place and, and, and could sprout among the poor. Sure, uh, leprosy and, and this kind of sickness uh, was, you know, uh, in, the, in the neighborhoods where there were no clean water and you name it. I mean, that's where you, most people probably expect it to happen. But no, this mighty warrior had leprosy himself. I just want you to know, church. That even the richest person, even the most famous 
individual on earth, they all, we all have a flaw in our lives. We all have a need of a healer and a savior. How many of you say that's right, right? So I want you to know that if you are sitting here today, this is not a church for perfect people. This is a church for people who need a perfect God. Some people will argue and say, come on, what are we doing? We, we're just churchgoers. Oh, but we still need more of Jesus every single day. Do we agree with that statement? We need Jesus every single day. And we just happen to come all together on a Sunday morning to give him praise. But church, he had a, 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 a sickness that could not be cured. His only solution was to leave town and live with the others who had the same symptoms. Now, church, I want you to imagine the mighty warrior, the people that people knew who he was. When they said his name, oh, that's, that's the mighty warrior. That's him. When people said and called uh, stories or, hey, grandpa, tell us a story. Oh, come here, come here. I'm going to tell you about a man. His name is Naaman. Oh, with just one sword, he was able to destroy a whole nation. There would be stories about this man. He brought a lot of great victory, a lot of success to his, to his, to his country. But, of course, he had a problem. He had a need. Verse 2. At this time, uh, at this time, Aramean writers, writers had invaded the land of Israel. And among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. So just picture it. There's, there is this captivity. There's, they're taking in prisoners. And there's this young girl. And that young girl said, all right, you come with us. And you are placed in the house of Naaman as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, to, to the one uh, in charge of her, he said, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of leprosy. Now, listen, who is the voice or who is the one bringing this announcement? It's a young girl who was taken for her, from her country, from her family. Now she's living among uh, uh, this house as a slave. Let me tell you something. She had the right to just stay quiet. And say nothing just out of spite. Out of just being mean. Like I know the solution to his problem. But because they took me in. And now I'm a slave. And I'm suffering here. I'm not going to tell you how your problem can be solved. She had the whole right to do that. But instead what does she say? Oh I wish my master can just go. Because I know where there is healing. I know someone who can help him. I have been there. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I know that there is power in Jehovah Jireh. I know that there is power in the King of Kings, in the Lord of Lords. Church, this is a young girl who grew up knowing who God was. This is a young girl whose parents taught her about God and about God, how he can heal, how he can restore. So, of course, when trouble comes, she relied on, her, on the stories of her parents. She relied on what she heard about God. And now she is here being a witness to a complete stranger, to someone who considered her even less than a dog. But she doesn't care about that. She just wants her master to be well. Listen, church, God places people and, 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 and characters in every story for a reason. And that is why, church, God here in this, using this young girl, I don't know about you, but I believe he's telling us that today in 2019, our kids, our youth can also be the voice of hope everywhere they go. They can be the voice of hope everywhere they go. Why? Because we are teaching them about who Jesus is. That when they go into their classroom and someone has a problem or an issue, instead of saying, hey, listen, um, I don't know, 
maybe we can just walk it off. I don't know what we got to do. Instead, they can say, oh, let me tell you, there is a Jesus. There is a Savior that can heal you, transform you, deliver you. There's someone I know that can help you. That's why, church, I encourage every parent to bring their kids to VVS, to our Sunday morning, to our Royal Rangers and Girls Ministry. Oh, for them to bring the young adults. On Friday, June 14, we have in our next youth, next youth service. I am telling you, the more that God is inside of them and that we equip them, the more that they're going to rely, not on their knowledge, but they will rely on the knowing of who God is. God is our everything. Isn't that awesome, church? Imagine the day that someone comes to you and says, hey, um, your son, we were, we were just talking over here about how we were having financial problems, and your son, he came over here and he said, do you know that God can set you free and can heal every financial situation that you have in mind? Come on, let's pray together. Wouldn't that be incredible? That your seven-year-old is speaking the truth of God to other adults or to other kids. Isn't that beautiful? This young girl said, hey, I wish that my master can see because I know of the solution. So Naaman, verse 4, told the king that the young girl from Israel had said. And then the king said to verse 5, said, go and visit the prophet. All right, so here's the part all right the 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 solution has been there's two of them only there's one you got to exile you got to leave the land or number two you got to go visit this uh, man that this young girl is talking about so now it's on Naaman's court for him to decide what's the word church to move what's the word to move we have that decision you can stay stagnant in your life or you can go visit this man that has the solution Now, the king told him, hey, man, hey, that's why that's, that's his name. Hey, name, man. Okay, that was funny in my head, but okay, let's move on. Go and visit the prophet. This is the king, right? The king of Aram told him, I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out, and no, watch this, carrying as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. In other words, Naaman was going to be very generous to this man because this man was going to help him. I mean, he's going to be generous to him. Praise God for generosity. Amen? Right? Praise God for generosity. Praise God for people who have a heart to just give. But look at what it says in verse 6. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, Am I God that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can't see that he is just, I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. Hold on, let's back up. What, what just happened? This is like one of those episodes where it just goes into commercial and you're like, What, what happened? Let's rewind it, right? And praise God for rewind now, right? That we can just rewind and back it up. Wait a minute. Who did the young girl told uh, for Naaman to go visit? The prophet, right? Remember that? And then the king said, you got to go and see this prophet. I'm going to send this letter. But where did this letter end up? In the hands of the king of Israel. Is he the prophet? No. Let me tell you something, church. Sometimes when we're trying to get our problems fixed, when we're trying to get our, 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 our you know, our quarrels, our, 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 our Facebook dialogue things, can we be honest? Sometimes we just go to the wrong people. Right? When we're trying to find someone to counsel us and give us a good, wise word, And God has already said, you got to go to a certain person. Oh, how many times we just, we are, we're not obedient and we just go to somebody else. And then that somebody else takes it wrong, what you're trying to ask them to help you with. And that's what it says here. I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. Have you ever tried to make a conversation on Facebook and it's it just, it's, it's just, you just, You're just voicing your, your, your honest opinion. 
And then it goes really sour. And everybody just hates you because of what the comment that you said, right? You were just trying to have somebody to help you out with a situation. Church, many times we just go to the wrong person. And God is saying, I'm not sending you to another king. I am sending you to someone specific that can take care of that problem. I'm not sending you to another authority. I'm sending you to someone who knows the very amazing, incredible authority of heaven. And I want you to go there. So the king took, hey, what's going on? This is not me. And then verse 8, but when Elijah, the man of God, the who of God, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent his message to him. Why are you upset? And I love this. Send Naaman to me. And he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. I love peacemakers, don't you? I love people who are able to walk into a situation and just make peace. I love that. Two people are arguing, and I love when someone can just walk in and just calm things down and bring a solution to the problem. Because can I tell you something? Shouting back and forth, it's not going to solve the problem. Oh, you've been there, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Exclamation mark, all caps. Text back and forth is not going to solve the problem. I'll say, that's right. It's not going to solve the problem. What's going to solve the problem is when we step back, take a deep breath, and just allow someone to help us to come together and find a solution for us. Naaman said, hey, just send them to me. Look at verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses. Again, he's moving. He's going through it. Naaman sent with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah's house. All right, so just picture with me. Naaman is sick. He's probably just, just, just covered and he's, and he's protected because he, he can't just ha have your skin exposed. I mean, people will just despite you. And so he's just covered. And he sends this letter. There's all this amounts of, of, of gold and silver and everything. And it goes before him. The king is upset. That this is not me. I can't heal anyone. Then Elisha said, hey, send them to me. So here he comes. He comes with his horses and chariots. And he waits at the door of Elisha's house. Just picture that with me for a second. Just think about your house. Look outside the window or the door or the little hole there in your door, right? Just look out there. And you see Naaman. With horses and chariots, right? And then watch. I would expect that the story would say that Elijah went out there and said, Hey, Naaman, come on in. Come on. Come on in. Come sit at my, at my table. Come sit. Come on. Let's, let's pray. Let me lay hands upon the sick. and They will be healed, right? But no, look at what happened. But Elijah, he's inside the house. He sent a messenger out to him with this message. <laughs> and here's the message. Ready? Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. Now, how many of you, be honest here today, how many of you, you have leprosy. In other words, you have this uncurable disease. You're, 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 you have sores all over your body. You are discomfort. You have probably not had a good night's sleep. The Bible doesn't say how long you had this sickness. But just let's say that you had it for a week, okay? I think a week is enough. One day is enough. Amen, somebody, right? One, way, one day is just enough. And someone just comes and gives you a message and says, all you have to do is you have to go into the Jordan River and you have to just go in and wash yourself seven times and you will be healed. How many of you, you will say, I will jump in whatever lake or whatever charcoal there is, I will be there. Come on, raise your hand. Let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Yeah, amen, right? I will just do it. I, I mean, I am tired of this sickness. I am tired of this disease. I'm tired of scratching my skin. I'm tired of suffering. What Whatever I need to do, I'll go and do it. I will move. I will move. I am sick and tired of it. I will move so that I can be healed. So look what it says. But Naaman became how, church? Angry. And what did he do? He stalked away. I don't know what, you know, done say exactly if he left or, or, or how far he went. But any of you have two-year-olds, right? 
Right? Any of you have 14-year-olds, and then when they don't get their way, they just, they just, they just. Any of you? Any of you? Right? <laughs> you see them, right? I mean, they're just, they're just upset and mad. Like you told them the most difficult thing that they had to do. Son, I just told you to pick up that piece of trash right there. It's right there. And they just walked away mad, angry. That's what he did. Look at what he said. Look at what name and expectations were. Okay? I thought. Can you hear his voice? I mean, he's a mighty warrior. He is holier than thou, or at least he's a warrior more than thou, right? He is someone of, of well-known. He is someone of fame. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me. Do you hear him? He is the one that has the disease. And yet, this is his attitude. Church, come on, let's be honest. We are all here. Every single one of us here, we all are in need of Jesus. We are all in need of Jesus. But can I be honest with you? We got to get off our high horse sometimes and just listen to the word of God. And just listen to good counsel. And don't just walk out of here mad and say, well, that was the worst preaching ever. I am not going to do that. What do you mean I'm talking? What, he's asking me that I have to forgive? I'm not going to forgive. He's asking me to love. I'm not going to love. He's asking me to do. It's not us, church. It is the word of God who is asking us to do something. The two. It was very easy for him to just go wash himself in the Jordan River. And to move. He said, look at this, I expected him, <laughs> I love this, I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord, his God, you hear that? His God, and heal me. Naaman had no relationship with the Lord. He didn't know who he was. He thought that the Elijah was just another uh, genie. Hey, Aladdin's out, okay? Hey, genie, you know? He thought he was just going to make him just, just wave his wand. Church, many times, I'll say for myself, I don't speak for you, I'll speak for myself. Many times, I just want to come to the altar. I have a problem, I just want to come to the altar. And I just want the pastor to just kind of wave his hand and for my headache to go away, for my back pain to go away, for my marriage situation to just, just, just dissolve and everything will get better. I just want the pastor to wiggle his nose, put his arms like this and just go this way and everything will be fine. Anybody else, would you be honest with me, right? Sometimes you just want God just to do, to become a genie. You just want God to snap his fingers and fix it all. But that's not his plan. That is not his way. And here, in this case, that's what Naaman expected. And then verse 12, he continues with his, uh, instead of moving and being and, and, and going into action, no, now he is just complaining even more. Look at verse 12. On the rivers of Damascus, the Habana, that almost sounded like the Habana. Oh, Lord, send me on a mission trip to Hawaii. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, right? The Habana, or the for far better than any of the rivers of Israel. Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away. Now how, church? In rage. And I've seen that. I've seen that. Listen, pastor, we need help. Man, financially we're struggling. Okay, well, you have to, you know, the Bible says you have to give your tithes and your offering. Oh, now that's what church is all about. They just want my money. Oh, that's it. I'm never coming back here. Oh, I'm going to go find another church. Here we go. There come, hey, pastor, you know, we're, we're going through my kids. My kids, they, they, they're not obeying the Lord. Okay, well, I encourage you that, you know, bring them to, to a service. I, I encourage you that, you know, you, you, you send them off to, to uh, uh, just, just bring them in and let us instruct in them. And then you bring that, 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 that counsel to the young man. And what the young man or the young lady? Oh, no, no, I'm not going to church. Oh, no, there's a bunch of hypocrites over there. Come join the club, right? <laughs> Church, sometimes we have to listen to the voice of the Lord. Have an open heart. Take a hold of his word and help me out. And what? Move. 
Come on, tap your neighbor and tell him, move. You got to move. And I love this. Let me finish with the last two scriptures. I love, love, love this part. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you shouldn't certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. See, that's why we got to surround ourselves with the right people, right? That's why I love our life groups. Because in our life groups, we are surrounding ourselves with people who are going to encourage us to do the right thing. That's what he's saying. And if he told you something difficult, you would have done it. But this is so easy. And verse 14. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River. In other words, he did what? He moved. He had to let go of uh, his, his, his attitude and his character and all of that. He had to let all of that go. He had to let go of who he was, humble himself, and move. So Naaman went down, last scripture, Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself, how many times, church? Seven times. And you know what? I can just imagine him. Dipping one time, nothing happened. <sighs> I knew this is this pointless. Right? I mean, he was angry. Dipping the second time. <sighs> see? See what I mean? You know what? I'm out of here. No, no, no. Seven times, Naaman. Seven times. Third. Fourth. Fifth. Sixth. And let me tell you something, church. Sometimes we stop at number six and we give up. And we say, God's never going to change me. God's never going to do anything. Oh, it's just one more. One more wash. And he goes in. And when he comes out, as a man of God had instructed him, and watch this. Look at the last part. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. Wow. Another translation says that his skin became as uh, just uh, healthy as the skin of a brand new born, baby born child. I mean, just brand new. And Naaman was healed completely. Completely, church. Completely. Look at the um, product of someone letting go of his anger, letting go of his own expectations, and just simply moving. Just simply moving. Just look at that. If all of us would just let go of something that is stopping us from obeying the, the, the man of God, the word of God, and just simply move, there is always going to be a final product, a blessing, a restoration, there's always going to be a, uh, what is the word, a, uh, a promotion in your, in your relationship with the Lord. There's going to be. There's going to be. Why? Because we serve a merciful God. We serve a God who loves us, takes care of us. We just read it in Psalms 37. He will not let go of your hand. So right there where you are, I'm speaking to people here today that you are in that situation where you need a healing. It might be physically, you might be emotionally, spiritually, you need a healing. And as a man of God here this morning, as my opportunity for me to speak to you today, I'm encouraging you for you to go down to the river and for you to go and wash, and it will all be made new. Now, what is the Jordan River for our lives? I don't know. For you, it might be for you to go into someone's house and ask for forgiveness. And if you need to ask for forgiveness seven times, go ahead and do so. There will be healing at the end of it all. I don't know what is your Jordan. You know, in this case, the Jordan was a messy, messy river. Maybe in your situation, your Jordan is a very messy, messy, messy situation. And God is just asking you, you got to go back. You got to go back, back into that relationship and ask for forgiveness. You got to go back into that job and you got to do things well. Submit yourself. 
That's what's submerging yourself. It's submitting yourself. You got to go back into that classroom, young man, young lady. And you got to submit it to your teachers. I know, as one kid say, all my teachers hate me. <laughs> no, they don't. It's just your mentality and what TV shows. Honestly, as an educator of 15 years, this is going to be my 16th year being a teacher. There has not been one kid that I've hated. So that whole concept is wrong. There's been kids that I don't like. But there's, there's no kid that I, don't, that I hate. Why? Because hatred is not of God. And the Bible says that if you do not love, then you don't know who God is. Because God is love. So right there where you are, would you close your eyes and bow your heads. God, you see us. We are all going through a situation. We are all in need of a Savior. And we're asking you right now to help us. You do me a favor, no eye open, every eye closed, except for our leaders and those of you who helped me pray. If you are facing yourself like Naaman, if you need to go to a Jordan, I don't know what your Jordan is, but whatever it is, if that's you, would you lift up your hands? I just want to notice who you are. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Father, you saw all the hands of, of need of going and just washing ourselves back into the Jordan. In that messy situation, God, we're just asking you that in Jesus' name, you will help us to let go of our attitude, let go of our expectations, and just go and be obedient because we want to be healed. We want to be completely healed in Jesus' name. Now with every eye closed, every head bowed, right there where you are, Naaman did not know who Jesus was, who God was. He went and he got healed. And then afterwards, the scripture says that he ran to Elijah's house. And he said, now I know that your God is a true God of Israel. In other words, something had to happen in his physical so that his physical eyes can see for him to respond to the real Savior. But you are here today in 2019, and I am encouraging you to walk by faith and not but what you see. Sometimes what we see is gives us the, even less hope. So you got to walk by faith, believing that there is a risen Savior who loves you, who loves you so much and wants nothing but the best for you. And if you are here today, you have never made him your Lord and Savior, or if you walked away from the relationship and you want to come back, you are always welcome. Would you say this prayer with me? Would you repeat and say, Jesus, I come before you as a sinner, and I ask you to save me. Wash my sins, cleanse me, make me brand new. I accept you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Every eye closed, every head bowed, right there where you are. If you made that prayer, would you lift up your hand and say, I made that prayer, Pastor. I dedicated my life to him. I gave.